So you know sometimes you meet someone and you feel like this is someone who really walks their talk, someone who's got kind of soil metaphorically under their fingernails and paint smeared over their bodies. It felt like that when I met Martin Ping. I met him for the first time about four hours ago in the Universal Hall here doing his technical rehearsal. He's just come over from the States. It's his first time visiting us in Fintorn, so a huge Fintorn welcome to you. And Martin Ping is someone who has been living and working with some of the solutions in a way for the last 30 years. He's the executive director of the Hawthorne Valley Association in the United States, which is an outstanding 900 acre biodynamic farm, which is dedicated to the regeneration of self, soil and society. It's a very integrated and extraordinary place. I haven't been there myself, but I looked at some of the videos that, that are from the, the Hawthorne Valley Association. They're very, they're really uh, inspiring. And he's come to talk to us about that and to share some of the dreams and some of the practices that they use in the Valley Association there. He's been there teaching practical arts in the high school. He was director of facilities for a while. He's served as executive director since 2003, currently teaches economics in grade 12. He's also a founding member of the Slow Money Movement and is a co-founder and storyteller for the Magical Puppet Tree. He's served on the boards of several not-for-profit organizations and he's also absolutely delighted to be a poppy to some grandchildren. So please give a very warm welcome, Fintorn welcome for the very first time, and we hope it will not be the last time, to Martin Ping. Thank you, Thomas. I'm really grateful to be here. I've dreamt about Finhorn. I've known about it since I was a teenager. It's really um, part of my journey, I would say. You, you probably have more to do with my commitment to living in community than you know. And that goes all the way back a long time. I uh, was thinking about speaking in Findhorn in Scotland, and I decided, well, I'll call the talk The Wealth of Places. And it's kind of a tongue-in-cheek nod to fellow Scott Adam Smith, who wrote The Wealth of Nations, published in 1776. And that's the same year that my fellow American, Thomas Jefferson, penned the Declaration of Independence. And I would say that these two documents have played an outsized role in how human and earth destiny have unfolded since, coming out of the Age of Enlightenment, on the heels of scientific revolution, dualism of Descartes, they really uh, set the pace for our Western, anyway, mindset around economics and polity and have certainly produced a, a mixed bag of outcomes. And it would be obviously uh, overly simplistic to say that in the ensuing 242 years it's been all good or all bad, but I would venture to guess that we're uh, approaching, if we haven't already hit the law of diminishing, diminishing returns, when we're gleaning the thoughts harvested from the field of our mental rational construct. Thankfully, our consciousness is not static, and it's my hope that we'll move beyond the, uh, the self-interested behavior of Smith and hyper-individuality and get to a place of uh, shall we say, uh, enlightened reciprocity and compassionate interdependence for all living beings and for the earth herself. So, uh, since this is a story of place, we'll start with our place. And uh, Daniel mentioned this Earthrise photo, I'll say something more about it, but this is a place of, to me, inestimable, inestimable wealth and beauty, and all places have their inherent wealth, and we all come from places, so we have this in common. In the, uh, in the interest of reciprocity, I would like to invite you to my place, and that is Hawthorne Valley. And in 1984, my wife and I were uh, expecting our daughter, and we were looking for a doctor who would help us to have a home birth. And so uh, we wandered into a place called Harlemville, New York. And on that first visit, I really met the being of Hawthorne Valley. 
a very, very intense encounter, one that is still deepening after 34 years, and one that has certainly transformed my life, our lives, I would say. Hawthorne Valley uh, is really trying to reconnect people to the earth, to each other, and to their own sense of self, and really trying to re replace us or remember us into that beautiful story that we are all participants in. And I think that all these crises that we see in this time are arising out of the, the uh, deep sense of disconnect and loss of meaningful relationship that, uh, that we can feel in these times. So it's Hawthorne Valley's work is to just simply try to provide the place and the opportunity for that reconnecting. It, it really is actually that simple. So one of our founders uh, actually wrote a little essay called um, the, Hawthorne, the Rudolf Steiner Farm School. And in it he said, what we are founding here is a seed, the seed of a living organism. The organism is essentially threefold, educational, artistic, and agricultural, as expressions of thinking, feeling, and willing. Each needs the other if the whole is to flourish. All are interdependent. For young and old alike, this work together will create a place in which it is possible to become, in a true sense, a full human being. And I've had the privilege of the last 30 years of walking to work each day to a place that has this aspirational uh, vision as its goal. We're uh, on a biodynamic farm in the uh, upper Hudson Valley, about two hours north of that little settlement at the bottom, New Amsterdam, New York City, okay. And uh, the interesting thing to me about the Hudson River is that the indigenous name is uh, Muhi Kunatuk, and it means the river that flows two ways. And it's actually true that from the tip of Manhattan, 134 miles inland to Troy, New York, the river is tidal. And I love this image, and I think about it all the time, that it's this constant dynamic flow. It's a watershed, it's a food shed, it's a culture shed between urban and rural. Hawthorne Valley's uh, contribution to this uh, rhythmic pulse is beginning on the land. So we uh, have our dairy herd adding fertility to the soil. And then we take the milk and we process it in our own creamery. We bottle raw milk and sell it in our store. We make a variety of uh, soft and hard cheeses and yogurt that's fairly widely distributed. We grow grains. We bake bread from those grains in our own bakery. We grow veggies and we sell the vegetables direct marketed through our CSA and then along with all of our other products uh, through a variety of green market stands throughout the New York City metro area. We have pigs, we have chickens, we have sheep, and uh, we have horses. We produce a line of lacto-fermented veggies and you can get all of these products and many other products from many other producers and farmers in our region in our farm store on site on the farm. And all these enterprises in a way create this ecosystem and a um, kind of a, the container that allows us to then do all of the pedagogical and cultural and research work that we do, including training the next generation of farmers through our farm apprentices pro apprenticeship program. We uh, formed something called CRAFT, the Collaborative Regional Alliance for Farmer Training. We started a, a um, chapter of farm beginnings in the Hudson Valley, a whole farm planning, and we work with collaborative partners on making farming as a vocation available to returning veterans, 
incarcerated people, uh, migrant, immigrant communities. Our Institute for Mindful Agriculture is actually trying to help cultivate the inner soil of the farmers. And our Farmscape Ecology Program is doing agroecological research on behalf of the entire farming community in our county and now spreading throughout the uh, Hudson Valley, really inviting a uh, opportunity for a more compassionate view of the land. We have uh, visual arts initiatives, theater arts, we have a publishing press, we have the Alkion Center for Adult Education, which is doing Walter teacher training. Some of those people who have gone through the training program end up teaching at Hawthorne Valley Waldorf School, which is a K through 12 independent day school on the farm. One program in that school is meeting the needs of children who have uh, different learning modalities. It's called Earth Program, and those children are getting their education primarily on the farm and in the forest. And I would have to say Hawthorne Valley remains a work in progress and we're constantly trying to adapt and address the needs of our time. And uh, next year, with, in collaboration with the Good Work Institute, we're going to start Place Corps. And it's a gap year type program for 18 to 25 year olds, which is meant to cultivate a calling to know, love and serve our places. Place-based education, education of the will, learning by doing, these are all core ideals right from the very beginning. Uh, in 1972, the first class of visiting students came from New York City. Every week since then, we have a class of students from either New York City, Baltimore, Boston, Washington, D.C., coming up and living for a week on the farm, doing agroecological related activities. And then we convert that to summer camps, and have also residential and day programming uh, during the summer. About 600 children a year in the residential programs and maybe just as many coming for the day programs. It's always gratifying to see, to relive this story over and over for children coming and having this connection the first time and going out and pulling a carrot or a radish out of the ground and eyes as big as saucers. And food comes from the ground and if it doesn't take clairvoyance to just see the, the wheels start spinning and you can see they're beginning to reconnect to, to essential parts of themselves and remember themselves into this larger story. So my beloved wife is an early childhood teacher at Hawthorne Valley Walter School and uh, she shares her impressions with me and I would like to share one of them with you because it's just so, uh, so beautiful. I invite you to join me on a walk with her and her kindergartners through the pasture. The bees are busy harvesting the first full flowering of golden pollen. White clouds sail across the blue vault of heaven while beneath the children are just as busy as the bees. Their senses are harvesting the world. They delight in the rippling waters of the creek, the song of the robin, the season's first butterflies. Look, our cows. They run to the edge of the field to gaze at the dairy herd grazing on the lush sweet grass. The cows placidly look up with peaceful eyes, then turn back to their ruminating work. I wonder, do the cows think of these children as theirs as well? Their milk nourishes these children like their calves. Each week the children visit the dairy and thank the farmer and the creamery workers for the yogurt that they get to bring back to the kindergarten. This quality of life and relationship is part of the education of the children. Here, living and learning are multidimensional. The children are at one with this world that speaks of an integrated harmony. They feel the fields, forests, cows, sheep, and farmers as theirs, not because they own them, but because they are part of them. The children live and learn within this wholeness of life. We all live and learn through these relationships. They are realized when we take time to connect to our place and be present to each other. 
This is essential for children if they are to understand the truth of the world. It is, it is the contextual foundation for, for all learning. It is the gift of our place and it is a gift in our time. Do you get service? A kindergartner asks as she picks up a stone from the creek and imitates a cell phone gesture. I think so, replies her friend. I like to ponder the voice of the stone to think that this rock of ages has a message for our children. I think we all need to listen to the stones to the earth, to the water. They are the beings of service. They serve us all and help make life flourish. Yes, we get service here. The farmers who bring the cows in before dawn to milk them or put the cow's manure into the soil to build fertility are living in service. The teachers who help the children strive for the truth to correct their mistakes when they are made, are striving to serve them. The coworkers who come and try to make each day a little more beautiful for all of us are in service. The parents who make sacrifices so that their children can attend a Waldorf school are in service to their children's future. Volunteers who serve on boards, committees, Community service are all providing service. When we serve, we are also ourselves served because our life in service to our community, our work in service to our community means our needs will be met. This to me is the reality of our life, our integrated life on this, on this earth, this, this unity of life in our universe. And this picture was taken actually on, as I understand it, December 24th, 1968, which would make this Christmas Eve, the 50th anniversary of this photograph and I'm involved in a little project called Earthrise 50, basically to invite people to uh, hold our Earth in our loving awareness while we approach this anniversary. So these are my ruminations as I walk down the cow path every morning with my granddaughter to walk her to school down the same cow path I walked her mother to school on. This is the, the wealth of places. All places have their inherent wealth, like all people. And it is my hope that we will uh, all move to this place of mutuality, uh, enlightened reciprocity, compassionate interdependence. And in so doing, this work together will create a place in which it is possible for us all to become, in a true sense, full human beings. Thank you. <laughs>